already dead. Looks like we both couldn't sleep tonight. I've been out in the rain just soaking in this story I just read about and it's been haunting me all night. It happened in July of 1988 in Tokyo, Japan. A landlord calls local authorities to report a tenant that has missed five months of rent. So officers were dispatched to the neighborhood of Sugamo, went to knock on that door in what was supposed to be a routine eviction notice. Turned into the worst case of child abandonment Japan had ever seen. This story went on to grip the country as more and more heart-wrenching details were learned by the public. And I hope you're up for this one, Dad, because this is the story that grabs your throat and chokes you up. And even when the grip loosens and you take that breath of relief, it comes right back like a demon in the night and starts to squeeze again. So as officers pounded on the door, it finally opened and they were greeted by a boy of about 14. And even at first glance of the boy and his dwelling, they already knew that something was terribly wrong. The boy was gaunt, severely malnourished, and the apartment looked completely disheveled. Trash on the floor, foul odors from every corner. As they made their way in, two more kids appeared, even younger than the boy was. These were his younger sisters, one age seven, and the other was just three years old, both as shockingly emaciated as their brother. The boy was the only one to provide any information, but getting anything out of him was extremely difficult. But eventually he admitted that he hadn't seen his mother in about seven months. So police, with no parents on site, or even the return in sight, had to take the children into custody, and the search for either parents was on. Investigators would enter the apartment for a more thorough search, and this is when they will make a discovery that was outright chilling. Because tucked away in the back of a closet, zipped in luggage, wrapped in plastic, were the tiny remains of a baby. And things got even stranger once the medical examiner studied the body. He found that the baby died at about two years old, but had been dead for an additional two years before it was found, which had detectives scratching their heads. Because the landlord said that the family had only moved in nine months ago but we'll eventually get to why that was. But for now, down at the police station, the two younger girls showed no signs of offering any information, and the 14-year-old boy was very vague when he did. And when he was asked to read and write, they quickly learned that his comprehension of both were extremely lacking. Side note, the identities of the people in this case have been protected by law in Japan, so I will be referring to the children by their gender and ages instead and the mother simply as Hobag, because she definitely does not deserve the sacred label of mom, which I'm sure you'll come to agree with by the story's end. Back at the apartments, the landlord tells investigators that a lady and her 14-year-old son came in around November to sign a lease agreement. In that agreement, it noted that just the two of them were allowed to live there. He didn't have a clue that she snuck in four more kids in that little cramped apartment, dead baby included. And by that puzzled look on your face, Dad, you just did the math. You counted five kids when I've only indicated four. So yes, one child is missing. But I'm going to need a drink if I'm to continue to this next part. So let's get into all of this, starting with each kid in order of birth. So the first child, the 14-year-old boy, is born in 1973 and was never on record having enrolled in any school, which would partly explain his inability to read or write. Then eight years later, in 1981, child number two is born, a girl, and she is the seven-year-old that was in that apartment. Not much is known about her, but she will play a role in how this story ends. Child 3 is born in 1984, another boy, and he was the body that was found in the closet. So here, let's tell his story. When he was two years old, he would gag on his bottle of milk. 
Now, choking or gagging is common for infants. What's not common is the parent to be so neglectful as not to notice their child writhing, basically dying in their arms. But as you learn more and more about Hobag, it would be more of a surprise that not all her children met a similar fate. So when she realized her baby was dead, being that he was undocumented anyways, she wrapped him in plastic and placed him in that luggage and stored him away and no one was the wiser. When it was time to move to that new apartment, the luggage was simply brought along and tucked away in the back of that closet where the detectives would uncover it, what was now down to almost just bones. Now I look at the mom's behavior in two ways. One would be that she was so heartbroken. She couldn't bear to dispose of her child like common trash, so she mummified him and kept him close forever. And the second was that she just didn't know what to do. Wrapped him up and stuffed him into a convenient nook and essentially just forgot he was there until she was cleaning things out to move and was like, oh, oh yeah, huh? So now back to our timeline. In 1985, she has child number four, another girl, She's the three-year-old that was discovered in that apartment. Little is known about her too, but she will also play a role in how this story ends along with her elder sister, child number two. And so finally in 1986, she would have child number five, which is another girl, which is the missing child in this case. A child that the police would have never known about until the 14-year-old unwittingly reveals her existence. When asked to name all of his siblings along with their age, he did just that. When the cops realized there was an extra name, a missing two-year-old, things became a lot more tense. But the kids all claimed ignorance, that they weren't sure where she wandered off to. So now the police were in a frenzy, as a two-year-old baby in all likelihood has been abducted. But the boy would eventually crack under the weight of his own lie. And he would tell a story that can make even the most seasoned of detectives look away in sorrow. Let's go back to the first day in that apartment in Sugamo. So when they first moved in, the mom did live with them for that first month. But then something incredible happened to Hobag. She got a new boyfriend. So what is a mother to do? She took her eldest boy aside, told him matter-of-factly that she had met a new man and was leaving to live with him. That he was now the man of the house to watch over his sisters. She gave him 50,000 yen, which is about $500, to buy food for the family. She would leave, but she would visit every other week for the next month or so to see how things were going, give the boy a little bit more money, and soon she would never show up again. This is also when she stopped paying for the apartment, nor the electricity, gas, or water. Eventually everything was turned off, and you simply had four confused kids in a dark box, slowly but surely starving in their own filth and waste. Of course it's hard enough for adults to raise kids, so you have to wonder how a 14-year-old boy with no guidance, no education, was going to handle the task of taking care of his younger siblings that consisted of two toddlers. Unfortunately, but predictably, he was terrible at it. His only instinct was to keep them fed, but all he would get was junk food at the corner store and not much else, leaving everyone under his care destitute of vital nutrition. Now the two-year-old dead. Her walk wasn't yet steady, so she would fall. And her stomach hurt from eating nothing but junk, so you guessed it. She would cry a lot. Because she was the one that needed the most nurturing in a household like this, she actually became more of a nuisance. And here we can tell her story and what became of her. So as it would happen, the 14-year-old boy would befriend two 12-year-old boys from the neighborhood and would allow them into the apartment. And they, of course, loved hanging out there because there were no adults. So they would run around the house and just do whatever kids would do with no supervision. 
and they would come over frequently and as they pleased because the door was never locked. Now the little two-year-old would always want to participate in their rowdiness, yelling along with them, wanting to play with them. But of course they didn't want to play with a baby and found her pretty annoying and would push her away and run off to play amongst themselves. So there came a day and the two friends were there playing in the house. One of them had brought over a bowl of instant noodles to eat, but he was saving it for later, just leaving it on the table. As the boys went off to play, the two-year-old girl, who was always hungry, smelled some food, and she saw some food. So she starts happily eating the noodles. She, of course, is eventually seen, and what happens next is what kept me up tonight, wandering in the rain. So the boy, whom the noodles belonged to, was furious, immediately grabbing the bowl and yells at her, which of course makes her cry, which makes him even angrier. And he smacks her right on the head. The other friend, following suit, hits her also, and they kept approaching her and beating on a now terrified two-year-old baby. The 14-year-old boy, hearing the commotion, comes running. Seeing what they're doing, he steps in front of his baby sister, and before Noodle Boy was able to protest, the older boy punches him in the face, laying him flat out on the floor. The other 12-year-old let out the beginnings of a shout that was quickly muffled by a second punch directly in the jaw, sending him to the floor with his friend. The two boys get themselves up, and they ran out of the house crying as the 14-year-old boy hugs his baby sister and looks on as they run home to their mommies. Is what I wish I could tell you happened. But if you like happy endings, just end the video right here and you will have it. But what actually happened was not that at all. The 14-year-old boy didn't protect her. He didn't stop what was happening. Instead, he added to the problem. He scolded her for eating his friend's noodles. At this point, the two-year-old girl was crying uncontrollably from the abuse she just bore. There was no indication of where the seven and three-year-old girls were at this time, but at some point in that day, the 14-year-old boy steps out of the house, leaving the two-year-old all alone with those boys. The boys, seeing their opportunity, grabs the two-year-old and they drag her, tossing her under a futon and began jumping up and down on it. One went so far as to climb a shelf and jumped. When the brother came home, he saw what they had done. He lifted the mattress and saw his lifeless baby sister underneath. I wish I could tell you so bad that he did something to those boys, but he did nothing, literally nothing. He left his sister's body there under the mattress for an entire week. It wasn't until the smell of decay had become too much did he get one of the 12 year old boys to help him place her body in a gym bag and bury the body in the nearby woods. completely horrified by what they just heard. Detectives immediately go back to Sakamo and locate the 12 year old boys and under the scrutiny of officers as well as their parents, the boys did eventually confess to what happened. Eventually, at the trial, the judgments came down. Now the courts in Japan are very lenient when it comes to juveniles, even for the most grotesque of offenses. So don't let any of these punishments be a surprise. It was concluded that the 14-year-old boy was not directly involved in his sister's death, but did assist in burying her corpse, which got him the conviction of abandoning a body. They send him to what is called a care facility until he is 18 years old. Now allegedly, this is what a care facility in Japan in the 80s equates to. Picture an abandoned apartment complex with multiple living quarters. In each quarter houses multiple orphans and troubled youths, with one 
adult assigned to supervise specific rooms. These programs are as tantamount to child abandonment in itself because they are underfunded, understaffed. The children are still fending for themselves as supervision is absent for the majority of the day. As for the two 12-year-olds, they are sent to a reform school, equivalent to juvenile detention here in the U.S. Their identities have been kept secret and are today simply living their lives. I'm certain not sharing with their new friends or spouses that they brutally murdered a two-year-old once upon a time. Then, on July 23rd, six days after the 14-year-old boy told that harrowing tale, Hobag is found in what was called a mistress house. Not much is explained in the case records, but if I had to take a guess what a mistress house is by that title alone, the fact that we knew that she left to be with her boyfriend, that that boyfriend was a married man that paid for a house to keep his mistress, his side piece, in. In August, she was indicted with child abandonment, which in Japan can get you up to five years. But you have to tack on two dead babies, both dying from her neglect, a confused 14-year-old who is not in school, two daughters of seven and three, all abandoned in a house with no lights, no running water, trash and fecal matter everywhere, and no protection from certain dangers, such as child predators, for seven whole months. So now let's see what the judge gives her. But if you have a pillow close by, grab it. Because you're going to want to scream into it. She was given a total of three years. At this point, I'm starting to think that her boyfriend was the damn judge. While testifying, this is how she describes her motives. She had gotten a new boyfriend and the kids were in the way. So she left them so she could move on with her life. Only the cruelest of humans can say this and do this to their children. But keep that pillow handy. Because remember how I said that the seven and three-year-old girls would play a role in how this story ends? Well, here we go. After three years, the girls are now ten and six. And when Hobag gets out of prison, she is given custody of the girls. At this point, we're all at a loss for words. But here's something for you to form even more thoughts about this woman, Dad. Each of her five kids are half-siblings. All have different fathers. She was easier than Sunday morning. A self-centered woman that prioritized herself above all else, even her children. And all those deadbeat fathers, no, they don't get a pass. I wish upon them... If they knew about the kids and still chose to ignore them, I'm not going to mince words when I say I hope there's a disgruntled Darlene in their life that will take a shotgun and just blow their dicks off. But there is a positive here, Dad. And that is, this makes you look like the greatest parent in comparison. I love you. And I'll have another story for you when I come across one. So, for now, have yourself a good night, if you can at this point.